Before we get into the sermon time, I want to have another prayer today, and I want us to, to remember in prayer uh, the people in West Texas. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Those Amen. firefighters, families, and, and, and all those that have lost so many lives in their families. Also those in, in the Boston area, too, uh, from this bond. And let's go to the Lord and remember them in prayer today. Dear Father, as we come before your presence today, Lord, Lord, there are many, many hurting families all over this country today, Lord, because many of them have lost loved ones in these two different areas, and they have family living in different states, Lord. Lord, right now, we just lift them up to you, Lord. Lord, such great tragedies, Lord, that has taken place. And Lord, we see these things going on all around us, Lord, and we know this is just the signs of the end of time. We know, Lord, that the day is coming back when you're going to come back for all those who know you as our personal Lord and Savior. The great rapture is coming, Lord. We know we must be ready. But, Lord, we lift up these families to you, Lord, and the loss of the loved ones. May you be with them. May you lead us and guide us today as we hear from you. In your name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 There's an old cowboy saying that is speak your mind but ride a fast horse <laughs> there's a black stallion with a saddle on out the back door back there just in case you don't like what you hear today but that is so true isn't it today i'll talk about the uh, parable of the young rich man you know a study of the nameless people in the new testament is very interesting in John, the sixth chapter, we read about a boy who gave his lunch to Jesus that fed 5,000 people. Now, this is interesting because this little boy was, he was pretty smart, I think. For one reason, I think he was a sharp kid. He thought of bringing his lunch to this big gathering here by Jesus' teach. The rest of the people didn't think about it. On the other hand, maybe he thought that Jesus was a little bit long-winded. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, he brought his lunch. But there was a need, and this little nameless boy was willing to give up his lunch, knowing he may go without a lunch. He was blessed, wasn't he? Because Jesus took that little lunch, and he blessed it. And it fed the 5,000 people. They had all they could eat, and there was 12 baskets of left. I often wonder, did the 12 disciples get the leftovers? Makes you wonder. But nameless people are interesting when we look at the New Testament. It encourages us to know that anyone can be used by Jesus, even a little boy. We can all be used by Jesus. In Luke, the seventh chapter, we read about a widow who was comforted by Jesus. This demonstrates that all of us are candidates to benefit from his presence. Now here's this widow and her son. And she only had this one son. And he died. And, and, and Jesus walks over to the casket and he, he lays his hand on the casket. And he says, get up. Get up. And the man got up immediately and he spoke. Now we don't know the name of the widow. We don't know the name of the son. But this shows that when we're in Jesus' presence, he can do any and everything. Think about that in your own personal life. No matter what you're going through, no matter what tragedy, Jesus can do anything when you're in his presence. When you're listening to him and following him, he can do anything. In John, the fifth chapter, we read about the healing of the man by the pool. This demonstrates to us that no condition is beyond Jesus' control. Here's a man for 38 years, and he had been very sick. So sick that he couldn't even get up and walk and move. And every time the pool here, the waters were stirred, the one that got into the pool would be healed. But this man couldn't get in fast enough. Somebody else would always get in. Uh, you know, that tells me there was probably no cowboys there. I know if there had been some cowboys there, they probably would have helped him into the pool, wouldn't they? Think about it. But, that's right, but they, they weren't there. But who came along but Jesus? 
And Jesus said, take up your mat and walk. And he took up his mat. He walked. He was healed immediately. Doesn't matter. Jesus is the divine healer. It doesn't matter how sick somebody is. Some of you today have sick families in the hospital. Jesus is the divine healer. He can do anything. We put our faith and our trust in him. He can take care of any problem. So we can really benefit from his presence and we can benefit also from Jesus when he has control over our life. There is another nameless person I want to talk about today. And this nameless person is not in the New Testament. And you, you listen to this. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but listen to this. The power of a letter. Most of you know John Wayne as an actor. You may not know what happened to him before he died. This is the story. Robert Shooter's teenage daughter, Cindy, was in a motorcycle accident and had to have her leg amputated. John Wayne is a big fan of Robert Shooter. He had heard Dr. Shooter say in one of his programs that his daughter had been in an accident and had to have her leg amputated. John Wayne wrote a note to her saying, Dear Cindy, sorry to hear about your accident. Hope you will be all right. Signed, John Wayne. The note was delivered to her and she decided she wanted to write John Wayne a note in reply. She wrote, Dear Mr. Wayne, I got your note. Thanks for writing to me. I like you very much. I'm going to be all right because Jesus is going to help me. Mr. Wayne, do you know Jesus? I sure hope you know Jesus. Mr. Wayne, because I cannot imagine heaven being complete without John Wayne being there. I hope if you don't know Jesus that you will give your heart to Jesus right now. See you in heaven. And she signed her name. She had just put that letter in an envelope, sealed it, and written across the front of the envelope, John Wayne. When a visitor came in to her room to see her, and he said to her, what are you doing? She said, I just wrote a letter to John Wayne, but I don't know how to get it to him. He said, that's funny. I'm going to have dinner with John Wayne tonight at the Newport Club down on Newport Beach. Give it to me and I will give it to him. She gave him the letter and he put it in his coat pocket. There were 12 of them that night sitting around the table for dinner. They were laughing and they were cutting up. And a guy happened to reach into his pocket and he felt the letter and he remembered. John Wayne was seated at the end of the table. And the guy took the letter out and he said, Hey Duke. I was in Shooter's daughter's room today and she wrote you a letter and wanted me to give it to you. Here it is. They passed it down to John Wayne and he opened it. They kept on laughing and cutting up and someone happened to look down at John Wayne. He was crying. One of them said, Hey Duke, what's the matter? He said, and can't you just hear him saying it? I want to read you this letter. He read the letter and then he began to weep. He folded it and he put it in his pocket. And he pointed to the man who had delivered to him, delivered it to him and said, You go tell that little girl that right here, right now, in this restaurant, John Wayne gives his heart to Jesus Christ and I will see her in heaven. Three weeks later, John Wayne died. You never know the wit your witness to another how it will affect their eternity. A nameless man that God most likely used to change the eternity forever for John Wayne. These nameless persons, along with many others, could represent many today in this service. Unfortunately, there is another unknown person of whom we want to identify. This young man can teach us some vital lessons 
We're going to read from Mark the 10th chapter, the 17th to the 22nd verse. Mark the 10th chapter, the 22nd, the 17th verse to the 22nd. This is the story of the parable of the rich young man. 10th chapter, 17th verse. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud do honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. There are three lessons that we can be learned from this rich young man today. The first lesson is being religious does not qualify us for heaven. Think about that. Being religious does not qualify us for heaven. Many of you are just like me. You wear maybe a cowboy shirt with this thing right here on it. It says cowboy, Country Cowboy Church with the praying cowboy. Many of you ladies have it on your blouses. We wear those out here into rodeo and arena events. We wear them to the restaurants, community events. We wear them to church. But I'm going to tell you something. Just because you got this on your shirt, on your shirt, does not make you religious. But a lot of people will see us in the community when they first see us. That's the first thing they think of. They see it and they think we're religious. You see, man sees on the outward appearance. God sees on the inward appearance. He sees our hearts. He knows us from the inside. You know, there was this old guy, and he was poor, and he worked on a big ranch. And this guy, he was real poor. He had old wore out clothes and boots. And he didn't have a lot. But his most prized possession was his Bible. He was so proud of that Bible every day. He would take that Bible and he'd read it and study it. And every opportunity he had, he would share the gospel with someone. There, there was these two little old boys one day on that ranch. Little nine-year-old boys. And uh, this little old snot-nosed boys, you know how they are. And he got them down and he says, can I share you? the love of Jesus, and they led him. And, he, and they began to share, he began to share with them about how Jesus loved them and died for them on a little rugged cross and how he can give them eternal, everlasting life. And if they would accept him and put their faith and their trust and their belief in him, they would go to heaven and live forever and ever. One of them little boys, that first little boy said, I want Jesus in my heart. He was ready. That second little boy, he kind of was one of those little kids that kind of fidgeted around and moved and halfway listened. And he kind of followed his friend and he said, yeah, I want Jesus too. Those little boys grew up. That first little boy, he became a world champion roper. And everywhere he went, he gave a great testimony. He didn't just wear Jesus on his clothes. He had Jesus in his heart. And he shared the love of God with everyone. Every time he was interviewed. He told people about that old poor ranch hand, that nameless ranch hand that he didn't even remember his name. When he was nine years old, it shared Jesus with him. And he was a great witness and led a lot of people to the Lord. The other little boy, he grew up and he became a world champion bull rider. Now, he was a little wild. Had to be a rider bull, didn't he, Terry? <laughs> a little crazy. But he was a little wild and he, he you know, he, he wasn't the same as his friend. But when he was around his friend, he acted religious. But he, he, he was married and kind of ran around with his wife and he kind of chased women and did a lot of things he shouldn't do. But every time he got around his buddy and he was interviewed, he tried to act like he knew all about God. But deep in his heart, 
He knew that he didn't have Jesus in his heart. And he kept thinking, one day, one day, when I get through riding these bulls, one day, when all the glamour's over, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus and I'm going to live for him. I'm sure you've known people like that. They say, you know, when I get through doing what I'm doing, I'll start living for Jesus. Well, that young man, one night, he got on one of those bulls. He only had to ride him for eight seconds. But he got on that bull, you know what? And he got bucked off before that eight seconds was up, and that bull trampled him to death. He didn't have one more second to accept Jesus. His time was up. There are a lot of people that way. Being religious does not qualify us to go to heaven. It really does not. But this young man here in this parable, he was very religious. His question shows us that he had a religious heart. Look here again at the 17th verse. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees. Fell on his knees now, okay? Before him. He said, good teacher. Good teacher. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Wow. He was searching. He was looking. It was a noble question revealing the hunger for a deep, lasting relationship. He recognized something special in Jesus. Notice his approach in that 17th verse. He was beyond the level of unbelievers, but peace escaped him. There are a multitude of good people who do not know the peace that Jesus offers. And Jesus spoke to many of them. The Bible does not call us to goodness. It calls us to godliness. Okay? This young man here represents a host of religious people who do not have peace. Do not have peace. There are many people today. They claim to be religious, but they don't have Jesus in their heart. They're not totally sold out to Jesus. They wear their feelings on their sleeves. Cannot do that. So we learn that just being religious won't get you to heaven. Now, the second lesson we need to learn is material possessions do not produce peace. Material possessions do not produce peace. You may have won all the prize buckles in the world for roping and sorting and riding. You may have won all kinds of trophies. You may have the biggest ranch in the county. You may have the most cattle on the hills. I don't care if you got three or four thousand. Material possessions will not give you complete peace. Only Jesus Christ can do that. <clears throat> Notice the description of this young man. His face fell and he went away grieved because he had great wealth. <clears throat> in Luke 18th chapter in the 22nd verse, we learned that he was a ruler. This young man represents many people who are well supplied with wealth. This is what the world considers to be necessary for happiness. Material possessions do not pr produce peaceful, happy lives today. Will not do it. You cannot have it. You can look at the TV news all the time and you see that people are living miserable lives that have a lot of wealth. The absence of material possessions does not automatically produce peace. Material things has nothing to do with the giving or taking away of eternal life. This young man here, he kept the things that he had for the price of the peace that he sought. Where is your treasure? Is it on earth or is it in heaven? Does all of your material possessions give you peace and happiness? Does it do that? Sean, come on up. Does it give you happiness? I don't think it does. Only Jesus Christ can do that. I've asked Sean to give a testimony today. He's going to give a testimony. Come up, Sean. Y'all bear with me just a little bit. It's my first time. I'm a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of elaborate on, on what Pastor Gary was talking about, a verse that, that really brings a lot of peace and a lot of joy to me is in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. If y'all will go there for just a second, and then I'll get started. Come on to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, 
and ye shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just the, for me, this, this verse brings so much joy. He, when Gary talked to me about coming up here and, and giving my testimony, I can sit here and I can talk to you about where I've been, what I've done, the horses I've trained, where I've shown, what I've won. It doesn't really matter at all. I, myself, go to uh, Philippians 3.13. This is, as I was writing this out, this is what kept popping into my mind. It's about looking forward. Amen. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before. We are dead to our sins. It is past. It's over. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it's over. It's past us. And we can move on, move forward, and start living our lives for God. Amen. Back here in, in 6.3, this is another very, a Romans 6.3, I'm sorry. Y'all don't have to go to all these, I'll read them to you. Know, know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him, baptized into death, that like Christ has risen up from the dead by the glory of our Father, even so we also shall walk in the newness of of life. Amen. All of our sins are past us. Yes. We can rejoice in the finished work of the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about those sins anymore. They're past. We're forgiven for our sins past, present, and future. It's over. We can move forward from there. Uh, excuse me just a second. That takes me back over to Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Peace. Through all the problems that we face every day, financial, family health, whatever it is, we have peace in our hearts because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You can't get away from that. Everything, put your faith in that shed blood of Jesus Christ and just, just hang to that cross every day. And it will, I promise you, it will bring, me, bring you peace. It does me. I've, I've, I've done everything wrong in my life. Everything. Not just once, multiple times. Um, and this right here, just putting my faith in that, in that shed blood. Six months ago, eight months ago, I was, I was a miserable person to be around. Absolutely miserable. I knew the Lord, but I never had that personal relationship with Him. And when I started getting into these, these Bible studies and really picking up my cross daily and studying the Word, the joy I've found. Amen. You hear so many people talk about, well, you give your life to the Lord, you can't do this, you can't do that. I can personally sit here and tell you, it's not that you can't, it's that you don't want to. You don't want to. Your heart's changed. You know, you, you just don't desire to be in that world anymore. And that's that's what it's done for me. Um, let's see. Uh, one verse that, that really sticks out to me, and I'll just kind of, I'm cutting kind of short, but one thing that, that really sticks out to me, and I, this is a verse I think about almost daily, is Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my Lord, or as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. And that's one thing that I try to run through my mind every day, no matter how bad it gets, you know, praise God, we serve the Lord. So, thank you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Peace. You understand what real peace is? What real peace is? The third lesson we need to learn from this parable is Jesus makes no compromise for anyone. You know, this young man in this parable could be a credit to any cowboy church. Jesus requires total commitment. There is no room in God's kingdom for half-hearted cowboys or cowgirls. That's what he's sharing with you. He's come to a point he realizes for real peace, he's got to get into the Word. It's not enough just to be saved. You've got to get into the Word and start studying God's Word. You've got to fellowship together with other cowboys and cowgirls. You've got to be in the fellowship. We have to do that. We have to be together, church. We have to be together. We can't be going all different directions. We've got to work together and be together. When we do that, we're going to reach other people and God is going to bless us and bless this church and bless you as an individual. There's no room here, like I said, 
for half-hearted Christians or cowboys or cowgirls. There's no room. Today it does. It takes that total commitment. There are no boundary lines in the lives of true believers. Jesus will not share our hearts. He will not. He will be Lord of all or not Lord at all. Got it? That's the way it is. What must we do to have eternal, everlasting life? We must accept Jesus' terms by giving him first place in our lives. Not second, first place. All of our lives, surrender all of it to him. And those who do this will live happy lives with Jesus. In John, the ninth chapter, we read that he sent a blind man to the pool. His obedience resulted in the restoration of his sight. When the stone was rolled away, Mary and Martha, they saw Lazarus walk out of that tomb after Jesus commanded him to arise from the dead. Think about that. Those who do not obey his guidance will miss the joy that they could receive. What will you do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? Will you be like this rich young man, not willing to give up material things? in this world to accept Jesus. My prayer is that you will be willing to give up those material things. That doesn't mean you've got to go out and sell everything that you own and give it to the poor. In this man's case, Jesus was speaking to him what he needed to do. You know what you need to do. God speaks to your heart and tells you you need to do that. You need to make that decision today. I'm going to pray a prayer with you. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, you can pray a prayer just like this. Dear Jesus, oh Lord God, Father of Heaven, oh Lord, I want complete peace today. I've been running a long time for you. I know that you're here. I don't want to be like that world champion bull rider that the eight seconds wasn't long enough and time ran out and I didn't have one more second to accept you. Right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and save me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer today, he's in your heart. You have that eternal assurance of salvation. Back there on the table where that offering bucket is, there's some orange forms like this. It says, this is my decision today. If you prayed that prayer, would you check that? If you'd like to join this cowboy church, you check that. Put your name, information, the phone number. You put it in an offering box or you can hand it to me. I'd be glad to call you on the phone and, and talk with you about that. All right? Thank you all for being here today. Invite somebody back next week. We will have leadership team meeting following this service after about four minutes, right after Kent gets through doing, I know, he's up there. After Kent gets through and the band gets through. Right after the service today, about three or four minutes, we'll take a break for guests that need to leave. We'll have leadership team meeting. If you're a guest, you are welcome to stay in leadership team meeting. It's not just for members, okay? Everybody's welcome to stay. All right? Kent. All right, this poem is called Ride Through the Brand by Red, Red Steagle. I don't know how many Red Steagle fans are out there. There's one phrase in there that I'd like to explain. It says, before the wagon went out. And that means that it was the wagon usually went out a day or two before the, the cowboys did for the, for the roundup. And this brand, I think he's talking about, I think it's brand of, uh, that we should uh, ride for. It's a uh, brand of being a Christian, branded by Christ. Poem goes, his skin looked like leather, he walked with a limp, and talked with a slow Texas drawl. His knuckles were knotted, his left thumb was gone. Said a stud bit it all late last fall. We knew he was lying, we watched him dally it up. But it ain't healthy to call him a liar. It was Saturday night before the wagon went out, and he was setting this new kid on fire. Now we've all heard his stories about places he's been. We all think that Jake's pretty strange. He looked over at me, said, I'm schooling this boy, about the unwritten laws of the range. The kid was enthralled, kind of like in a trance. Jake sensed that he had a good grip. He straightened up, hitched his pants, took a drink of cold water, turned around with his hand on his hip. He said, son, a man's brand is his own special mark. 
that says, this is mine, leave it alone. You, out, you hire out to a man, ride for his friend, and protect it like it was your own. You hire out to string barbed wire, then build him a fence, don't matter if it's four or five strands. Remember it was you who asked for the job, so don't complain when you ride for his friend. The boss don't call with complainers, he'll fire one before he can quit. So if you don't like your outfit, then head down the trail, find a horse that your saddle will fit. But if you get up early and catch your own bronc, show the boss that you're making a hand. He'll be there to cover your bets as long as you ride for his friend. He said the winter I spent at the Sixes, we had a man at the old tailor place. He rode up on some hiders, a skin and a cow, and squared off at them scamps face to face. He could have rode off, never looked back, but he wasn't that kind of man. We found him in Ash Creek, shot all to heck. Nakona Joe died for the brand. We know the old man tells a windy or two, like the one about losing his thumb, and Nakona was killed in a bar in Fort Worth by the demons in a bottle of rum. But I got to thinking about what he had said, and the more of it I understood, the more I believed. We all be better off if more people would write for the brand.